Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Sue Holden, Executive Director for Earthwatch Europe. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Royal Geographical Society for the annual Earthwatch debate. There are about a thousand people attending, either here in person or online. So that is a fantastic response. Thank you. And I think that demonstrates the importance of the subject that we're going to be debating tonight. Um, Earthwatch, as many of you know, supports conservation projects all around the world. Um, and I know that many of you in this room share our passion for the, for the d diversity of species um, on our planet. But I know that also many of you share our concern for the challenges that the natural world is facing. You know, from the loss of habitat to the unsustainable use of, of natural resources to the invasive species that are coming in um, and to the huge loss of biodiversity. Um, and I think it's easy for us to think of these problems happening in so somewhere else, far-flung places, perhaps exotic places like rainforests and, and coral reefs. But actually here in Britain, it's happening. And in the last 40 years, we've lost something like 50% of our farmland birds. So should we bring back these, these species that have been lost? Should we redress the balance um, and bring back species that once played a really critical role in, uh, in our ecosystems? And you know, can we live on this well-populated island, um, islands with wild, wild mammals? And would people accept the change in habitats in landscape that would happen if natural evolution was, uh, natural um, regeneration was allowed to continue um, and expand so that more wilderness was created. So, lots of questions. Earthwatch doesn't have the answers. Uh, what we like to do is bring together scientists, practitioners, with stakeholders, with people who manage land, who manage conservation areas so that we can debate the issues, we can understand what the challenges are, and hopefully, collectively, work on solutions. And if you would like to take your interest in the work that we do further, Earthwatch has got a series of exciting research projects all around the world, um, and you can join them. So look us up online. So, we hope that tonight's going to be an opportunity to um, hear different sides of the argument, to learn something new, consider alternative perspectives, and maybe meet a few people, connect with a few people who share our passion for the environment. Um, but before I get started, I just want to thank the Earthwatch team who have worked really hard to ensure tonight's event was a success. And clearly, by the numbers of people, um, it, it already has been. Um, and I would particularly like to give my thanks to our sponsors of the lecture series and this debate. So our friends at the Mitsubishi Corporation Fund for Europe and Asia, who have generously supported this for many years. Thank you. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our chair, who really no, needs no introduction from me. Um, Kate Humble is a, a writer, a presenter, farmer, traveller, explorer, um, and Kate is somebody who's helped Earthwatch, has been an ambassador for Earthwatch um, over the years, and so it's great um, to have you chair tonight's event. Thank you very much for taking time out of your, your busy schedule to, to be with us, and Kate's interest in, in nature and agriculture, I think, make her the perfect chair for tonight's event. So. Without further ado, I will hand over to you to start the proceedings. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's fantastic to see such a full house here um, for such an interesting, uh, contentious and uh, exciting question. The question that we're going to be asking you to consider tonight is, are you in favour of rewilding the UK? 
It's a very simple question, and I may be talking out of turn here, but I suspect that a lot of you have already made up your minds. So in just a bit, I'm going to ask you that question again, and I'm going to ask you to vote on it before we've even started, just out of interest. Then we'll have the debate and see how many of you may or may not have changed your minds. There are an enormous number of people, and I suspect you are amongst them in Britain, who would describe themselves as someone who loves wildlife. They never miss anything with David Attenborough on the telly. They will happily spend money on feed for their garden birds and pay an annual subscription to be members of a conservation, <coughs> excuse me, a conservation organization like the RSPB or the WWT. But how wildlife friendly are we really? Do we, this nation of wildlife lovers, really love wildlife? Or do we only love it when it's compartmentalized in reserves or safely and comfortably visible on our TV screens? How much do we really want deer eating our herbaceous borders? Do we want badgers digging up our lawns, swallows nesting in our porches, and how dare they defecating on our front doorsteps? Do we want bats in our belfries? If we find these relatively benign creatures difficult to deal with when faced with the reality of living side by side with them, could we really cope with a wilder Britain, one that once again supports big predators like wolves or lynx, or even the vegetarian, and it is vegetarian, it doesn't eat fish, landscape-changing beaver? Rewilding has become a more and more common point of discussion. When scientific papers and surveys constantly remind us that we are losing species worldwide at a rate of knots, should that not be a warning sign, an indication that current conservation methods are failing? Do we need to think more radically? Do we need to be braver? Should we, as supporters or some supporters of rewilding think, let nature take charge again. Let it manage our wild spaces rather than us humans with reintroduced once endemic species that would allow for a more balanced ecology, one based on the Britain of centuries ago. That it is only by doing that that we will see a return of trees to once treeless landscapes, healthier rivers, an increase in biodiversity, a greater harmony in our natural world. Or is that simply impractical? Have we already gone too far the other way? Is our landscape too denuded to support these once common species, too crowded are our demands on land for farming, housing, development too important to us and too important to our economy to allow great tracts of it to simply run wild? Are we prepared, really prepared, to make space for nature? And more importantly, do we really want to? Rewilding may be a concept more widely talked and written about now, but that has made it no less contentious, which is why this evening promises to be a humdinger of a debate. Believe me, I've been in the room with these five for the last half an hour. You're, going to, you're in for an exciting evening. Now, what's going to happen is that our five speakers tonight will come up one at a time and talk for eight minutes, a very strict eight minutes. There is somebody going to be handing out, uh, holding up signs saying, your time is up. Once they have all spoken, um, they will then be allowed to question each other a little bit. We know already that there are going to be points that they don't agree on. And there may be points that you then want to pick up on and you don't agree on and you want to question, so we will then open up the questions to you. We do have roving mics, but in my experience, particularly with the number of people that we have here tonight, it can take an awfully long time for those roving mics to get to you. So what I suggest you do is that if you feel brave enough, uh, put your hands up. I will point to you, and if you can stand up and just tell me your question, I can then reiterate it to the audience and to our panel. Um, once we have done that, we will ask for you to vote. So once again, I'm just going to remind you of the question tonight, uh, which is, are you in favour of rewilding the UK? And let's, as I say, just out of interest, find out how many of you 
are in favour of rewilding? Can you put your hands up? I'd say that's an overwhelming majority. Okay. Well, let's see what changes. Just one other thing that would really help our panel tonight, somebody, something that, that they've all asked. Would, um, anyone, uh, would anyone who lives in the countryside and perhaps does have livestock, whether you're a smallholder like me, someone who has a small number of livestock, or um, your lives kind of depend on your livestock, can we just get a sense of whether there are any farmers, livestock owners in the audience? Would you mind putting your hands up? Very few. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, I think we should get going because, as I say, this is going to be one hell of a night. So our first speaker this evening is Dr. Christina Eisenberg. Uh, she's the lead scientist for Earthwatch US and has a PhD in forestry and wildlife from Oregon State University. Christina comes from a ranching background and lives in a remote log cabin in northwestern Montana, where grizzly bear and wolf populations outnumber humans. Christina is an ecologist who studies the ecological effects of large carnivores, and her Earthwatch project focuses on how wolves and fire are shaping the landscapes of Alberta, Canada. She is also the author of an extremely successful book which looks at how humans and carnivores can and perhaps should live together. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Christina Eisenberg. Thank you, Kate. It's wonderful to be here. I am going to share with you my experiences with rewilding as a scientist, as a landowner, and uh, insights from North America that can help us with this rewilding debate and understand the process better here. So first, though, we need to start with the dewilding. So this is North America in 1804 at the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And this is La Liberté and Ripple's work. They mapped the ranges of eight large carnivores in 1804 based on early explorers' records. Now, North America is the New World, so all of this colonization took place much after it happened here in the UK. This is the range of those same species in 2004. These range contractions are entirely attributable to humans killing carnivores. However, if we were to redraw this map today, 10 years after this work was done by La Liberté and Ripple, these ranges would go, I don't know if you could see my laser pointer, they would go about like that. So the rewilding is, is proceeding like wildfire in North America. And the reason for that is because humans are allowing it. So wolves were extirpated from Europe um, a lot earlier than what happened in North America. But in the US, the extirpation had taken place by 1900. And extirpation means killing a population of an animal until it's extinct. In the UK, the last wolf was killed 200 years ago. However, they were really missing uh, in any functional way much earlier than that. This had to do with fear. This is T-Rex. This is from the, your Museum of Natural History. I took this image last year when I was giving a talk here on uh, the role of wolves in ecosystems. So we have been afraid of anything with sharp teeth and clawed for, claws for millennia. And we thought that by ridding ourselves of species we consider threats, we would have a much more prosperous life. And these myths about how dangerous these species are to humans, in reality, they're not very dangerous at all to humans. We're um, propagated by fairy tales such as Little Red Riding Hood. This is the original first edition woodcut illustration from that book. Rewilding in North America has to do the way we define rewilding in North America, and there's many def definitions for rewilding it. You'll see tonight it means slightly different things sometimes to different people. It's simply allowing ecological processes to resume. 
and predation is one of those. Um, the impacts of species such as beavers, you know, ecosystem engineers, um, species that in a small number have huge effects. Um, those are examples of these ecological processes. It involves recognizing that nature isn't just a collection of organisms, like organisms in a zoo or museum, but it has to do with their ecological relationships to each other. And I'm going to explain what that means. And it's allowing nature to find its own way. That, that's George Monbiot's definition. However, in a managed world where there are people using resources, in North America what that means is managers work with these forces of nature and, yes, allow nature to find its own way within what is appropriate for different areas. So I'll back up. These are the six species of large carnivores I write about in my book, The Carnivore Way, and that's wolf, wolverine, grizzly bear, lynx, puma, and jaguar and they have all returned to places where they had long been extinct. These are their ranges. Now, I want to point out this corridor in the west. I call that the carnivore way, and that is a corridor along the Rocky Mountains that all of these carnivores use to recolonize these systems. It also coincides where there are larger, larger tracks, most of the protected wilderness, is in North America and where there are fewer people. So I live right about there. So why did this happen? Why did we just change our minds about carnivores? Well, a lot of it had to do with the work of Sir Charles Elton, who's a British ecologist, who in 1926, when he was 26 years old, over a four-month period, wrote a book called Animal Ecology, in which he lays out all the foundational concepts of ecology that we use today. So this is an illustration from the scientific journal at Oregon State University, Terra, and it's a wolf that holds the whole universe in its mouth. That, the scientific term for that is trophic cascade. So by preying on a species like an elk, a wolf has the ability to indirectly create habitat for things like songbirds and butterflies because it affects how its preferred prey species eats. And when elk can't stand around acting like lawn ornaments and, or livestock, they start giving plants a break and you start getting healthy forests again and that creates a home for songbirds. So that's a trophic cascade and that's what I've been studying for the past decade. <coughs> So these two books are books that I wrote that have to do with these relationships. And Aldo Leopold, an American conservationist, um, he said, to keep every cog in wheel, he wrote this in 1936, is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Charles Elton was his best friend. And so these are the revolutionary visionaries, and, and this is as revolutionary as some of Darwin's ideas were in his time. So what is a keystone species? Originally, the term meant a dominant predator that has a preferred type of prey animal, what it likes to eat beyond everything else. So using wolves as an example, that would be the elk or the red deer in this country. Um, with lynx, it would be the snow, the hare. So this relationship causes those cascading effects in food webs called trophic cascades. And when you remove a a keystone, well, this is a metaphorical term. The term keystone, it stands for the keystone of a Roman arch, and I think all of you know what happens when you remove that keystone. Arches and ecosystems fall apart. These relationships are everywhere. You can see them in foxes on the Aleutian Islands, in Venezuela, in the rainforest. So the images on the left side of this, all of these, those are systems that are dewilded. That's before predators were allowed to return. And you can see the profound ecological shifts, mainly having to do with habitat being created for other species that occur when a system is rewilded. So in Yellowstone, on the Serengeti, um, if you look in the oceans, you see these relationships, these trophic cascades playing out. However, I want to caution you, they are not a one-size-fits-all solution, 
there's a lot of different ways that they can occur. In Europe, um, the blue area is everywhere that there are wolves today. The green is everywhere that there are not wolves today. So wolves have been protected here since 1992. These nations have taken exception to that protection. The IUCN, the UN's body that governs species recovery, has classified the wolf as a species of least concern. There's currently over 11,000 wolves in the European Union. Um, this shows you how those wolves are distributed. And you can see that um, Russia has most of the wolves. So this gives you an idea of the rewilding that is occurring beyond the UK. And so the question is, is this appropriate here? So we know this, this, is, this is the UK, and the green are all protected areas. We know today the protected areas are not enough for rewilding to occur. You have to deal with agricultural areas and human populations. So rewilding is as much about people as it is about anything else. Rewilding creates enormous ecological benefits because it greatly increases biodiversity. And in a world where we're grappling with climate change, that is conservatively going to cause 70% of the species we have today to be extinct by 2100, rewilding gives us insurance, a buffer against climate change that is essential for all of our well-being. But we also need to find a level of rewilding that humans can live with. So humans need to be able to live well, too. I'm closing with this slide. This is a museum exhibit on wildness, and they chose to illustrate it with a pair of stuffed wolves. This is from a friend of mine who got a PhD in anthropology, and she found profound irony in this museum exhibit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, already food for thought. Um, let's give you a little more now. Um, our second speaker is Professor William McGill. He's Associate Dean of Engineering at Rheinwall University of Applied Sciences in Germany. He's both an engineer and a biologist whose interests focus on coastal and riverine environments. William has led Earthwatch teams for more than a decade and currently leads on a beaver research project in Germany's Lower Rhine region. These expert builders were reintroduced to the neighboring Netherlands in the 1980s and have since made their way into the densely populated Lower Rhine. William. Right. Thanks very much. Um, i get the technology to work here. So, um, yes, so I, I wear two hats. One is as an engineer and one is as a biologist. I get to do amazing things with Earthwatch. I get to go and, and find whales. I get to find turtles. And I get to go to fabulous places off the west coast of Canada or Mexico. And I've been doing that now for a better part of 20 years. Um, so I've been living in that wilderness. And I, I've had a chance to actually experience what these wildernesses look like. And so I know that wilderness is a messy place. It's a scary place. It's a chaotic place. It is what it says on the tin. It's wild. Right? And so when you look at this, and these are the kinds of houses we live in where there's absolutely no facilities whatsoever, uh, and then we have um, places where we can do the things that we don't have facilities to do. Um, and then um, I moved to a more civilized part of the world, shall we say. Uh, I come over here, I spent 10 years in Bath, and now I'm in Germany, and um, I went looking for the closest thing I could find to a marine mammal uh, in my landlocked uh, part of the world. Um, my, my experience with land use planning, all joking aside, comes from having spent, as I say, 20 years living on the coast of British Columbia, um, where we got involved in, some of you may know the sort of story of the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, we spent a lot of time, I actually got to draw some of the parkland borders, very proud achievement in life, uh, and uh, got to know what the challenges are and what land use planning is all about from the point of view both of the management as a stakeholder uh, and as a scientist. My words that describe wild, chaotic, um, what's the right kinds of words, uh, the wild wilderness and the aspects of wilderness aren't words that describe the forests of this part of the world particularly well. 
If you walk through a European forest, you find something that's very managed, very carefully managed, very cleaned up. It's been made, it's been made safe, right? It's had, uh, it's been engineered. These are, these are areas where we have cleaned up the environment to the point where it looks like what we want it to look like. So it doesn't look like those wild things, like this kind of a wild place where this is messy. You know, clean this up. Get the stuff out of the way. Make it so that I can get through there. Well, okay, I'll build a bridge over it so that I don't have to clean through the bushes. What do I do instead? Well, this is what our world looks like. Right? We've got rivers here. They've been dammed. This is highly modified environments. We've got all of these terraces over here. These are farmers' fields, roads going through them. Everything that we do in our impact, we are not this guy, ecosystem engineer. No, no, this is ecosystem engineering. We are engineering our environment. So we need to treat it in some kind of way, essentially the same way we would deal, in my opinion anyway, the way we would deal with any engineered system. Here's an engineered system. Everybody knows this kind of engineering, right? Lovely truck, all the aerodynamics of a brick. Fabulous machine, right? And we're going to put people standing on top of it. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to load suitcases on top of your car, right? Doesn't work very well, you end up with a dent. Right? So you have to engineer some kind of a system so that you can put people on top of your car. There's the wrong button here. Um, so that you know whether the, whether the car is going to stay there. Are people going to be able to do it? There are people that sleep on top of these things. Is it safe? Can I do it in a safe way? How do I do that? I model it. I simulate it. I make some prototypes and I test it. My argument is I need to do the same thing with my ecosystems. If I'm going to engineer a system, if I'm going to work a system, then I need to engineer it in the same way, with the same dedication and the same amount of effort that goes into engineering a fabulous system like this, right? Regardless of what engineered system it might be. So there's a, there's a process to this. Engineers have a way of doing things, right? We have a methodology. Slow, plodding, geeky, whatever you want to call an engineer. I'm, I'm a dean of engineering. I'm okay with that, right? I design machines to work underwater. Underwater is not a happy place. It, electronics and water equals smoke, right? It's not a good thing. We have a method for dealing with challenges like that. What do we do? First thing we do, identify the system, the challenge. What is it we want to do? That's what we're here tonight to debate. Do we even want to do this? Once we make that decision that we want to do this, that we want to go and rewild, then we need to follow a process. And we need to follow that process and we need to go through, identify what we need to do, right? We need to identify how the system works and understand that system. We need to model it. We need to work with it. We need the science to be able to understand what's going on. First step. Then after that, we need to identify things we can do and how we can do them safely. Try them. Try them in prototype. And then, only once we've figured out how we can do this safely without necessarily blowing the whole thing up, then we can start thinking about rolling it out and, you know, selling Land Rovers to people, right? When we're dealing with a, a wild environment, we've got this process. Let me run through some examples of things that I have seen, admittedly not wolves in Great Britain, but let me look at some systems that have some relevance. I like cute furry things with whiskers. It, you know, we say we, we kind of look like our study animals. Does that, does that work? <laughs> All right. So sea otters, you may know the story, fabulous reintroduction story. These guys, they were going to uh, have to move them out of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, where they've been forever, for a whole series of reasons, introduced them into Washington State and southern British Columbia. These animals have then expanded into a, an environment that was ready for them. There was a whole stack of urchins that had been set free by the absence of these animals for years. So you had these so-called urchin barrens. Wherever there are no sea otters, plenty of urchins. That means no kelp. Add sea otters, remove urchins, add kelp, you've got places for fish. Lots of fish, lots of biodiversity, fabulous place, and we see this cycling going on. So the thing that needs to be done there, or we see that happening in Alaska, fabulous. Tried to reproduce it in Puget Sound, in Washington State, didn't work. Nothing happened. My unfortunate colleague's graduate student was trying to be a sea otter. Trying to be a sea otter and, and harvest urchins, and it didn't work. Why didn't it work? It didn't work because the process that had been identified so nicely in, in the Aleutians didn't take into account some of the local aspects of the environment. So things that you're going to do, introduce a species, has to be done taking into account the local environment, has to be tuned. Um, this is a gray whale about to slime this person. Um, so here we have uh, a gray whale. Fabulous you know, reintroduction, rewilding, if you like, of the North Pacific. 
What an experiment. These guys just about wiped out in the 1940s. They breed down here and they swim up here into the Bering Sea. What do they eat when they're in the Bering Sea? Well, they eat mud. Well, the shrimp in the mud, right? Um, and so they've been doing that, increasing in population since the 1940s. And then by about 1980, there were 20,000 of them. Early 1990s, we said, hurrah, we've managed to recover the gray whale. We'll take them off the endangered species list and have a big party. Ten years later, somebody went up here and had a look in the Bering Sea to see where the whales were, and they weren't there. Gone. 20,000 whales, missing. AWOL. Where were they? They were along the shore here, around the edges of the Bering Sea, feeding in another, kelp, in another habitat. Why? Because when you went to look in here, there was nothing left. That mud, gone. Completely gone. An entire ecosystem the size of the North Sea, in fact, bigger than the North Sea, gone. Why? The gray whales ate it out. They ate their own habitat out of house and home. So, if you, if you don't control it, they're feeding in a habitat that's being exploited by all kinds of things, including themselves. And they made a mess of it. We made a mess of it. They made a mess of it. The ecosystem fell apart. Fell apart. Changed. So you need some control. If you're going to have a highly controlled, highly managed ecosystem, like, for example, this that's just really highly fished, then you need to control it. These guys. Okay, we're going to get over the cuteness after a minute here. But I think they're fabulous. So we have these beavers in the area that I'm working in. They were introduced there by themselves. They wandered in from the Netherlands. They all speak Dutch. It's terrible. <laughs> right? So we've got these beavers here, and we know that they're from the Netherlands, as I say, because they speak Dutch. Um, and they support the wrong football team, but that's okay. So we have these guys that are in there, in the system, moving into a system, making a lot of change to an ecosystem that didn't have them. Right? It's an engineered ecosystem. Remember, we're talking about Central Europe here, well, Northern Central Europe, a place that's been highly modified for thousands of years. And we're reintroducing this beaver into the system, or rather, it's introducing itself into the system. It's a good thing. Forest ecology, fabulous. Knocking trees over, you, know, you may know the stories, knock a tree over, make some space, allow stuff to grow. And on the edges of ponds, we have a whole different ecosystem going on there than we do deep in the forest. Fabulous stuff. Trouble is, these guys also have a taste for ornamental trees. So if I'm stuck in my big, valuable trees out there and a beaver comes along and eats it, I'm a little bit disappointed. Right? I'd also, this beaver also likes to build dams. Oops, now I've got flooded problems. It also digs into dikes. In Germany, not a good idea. Right? We don't want to flood the place. So we have some issues, collisions that are happening from these animals. Unexpected consequences of having released animals into the neighboring Netherlands are now affecting Germany. Is it a bad thing? We can debate that. And finally, this guy here. Um, I throw a bird up here. This is a fabulous bird, lapwing. It's a, it's a ground breeding bird. It needs ground, flat open, grassland, not forest. In some of the lakes around where we are, they've made some new islands out of these gravel pits, and they put these islands out there, and then left them for these guys to breed on. Very, very quickly, those islands get colonized by small trees. And very quickly, we have a whole succession that would if I left unchecked, end up in a treed-covered island. Totally useless for this guy. He needs grass. Or, well, she. She's the one doing the breeding. Sorry. Right? So we have this, this issue that if we don't control that ecosystem, if we don't actually control a new habitat, these islands didn't exist before, if we don't control that in some way, then we lose the objective we were trying to do. So gathering all that together and trying to summarize what I've just said, um, I believe that anything we do in Europe, anything we do in the UK, we need to deal with an engineering process. We need to engineer that environment because we already have. So if we're going to rewild it, we need to do that in a careful, methodical, plotting way. We have the advantage in the UK of being able to do that carefully and think about it. We've got time. So we can take our time and do it right. We can think it through. We need to understand the ecosystem we're working in. We need to do the work and we need to fund that. We need to make that happen. We need your help in making that happen. We need to model, we need to prototype, we need to understand, we need to do the science. We need to do the prototyping, we need to do the trials. We're going to hear about those a little later. We need to then find a balance, decide how that's going to work and how would that fit? What would that perturbation do? We need to expect the unexpected. We need to expect that things are going to go wrong. Engineers do this all the time. They call it a safety factor. You get into your elevator, up you go, you call it a lift in this country. You get into that thing and what do you do? You don't want the cable to break because it isn't optimized, it's huge so that it doesn't hurt, right? So we need to optimize, we need to find safety factors. We need to monitor, we need to control, we need to be able to say, okay, this has gone too far now, just like my talk, I've gone over my time, I need to sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So from an engineer's point of view, to an agriculturalist, can agriculturalist can't speak anymore, agriculturalist's point of view. Andrew Bauer is the Deputy Director of Policy for the National Farmers Union of Scotland, an organisation which aims to secure the sustainable future for Scotland's farmers and crofters and has near to 9,000 members. Andrew's role encompasses policy development and lobbying on most environmental issues affecting Scottish agriculture and that of course includes rewilding. Andrew. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to Earthwatch and uh, the organisers of this event. It's a real pleasure to be here to speak on a subject that I would say for most farmers is on the periphery. I think it's gaining, uh, uh, what would you say, uh, presence in their mind, but at this moment in time, it's still definitely a niche issue for most farmers. Just by way of an introduction, Kate's already explained a little bit about NFU Scotland. Uh, we represent everyone from the smallest crofter to the biggest arable farmer in Scotland, be they tenant or landowner. We are separate, completely separate organisation from NFU, England and Wales. And I think we're in a very good position to represent the views of rural land managers across Scotland. I suppose as, by way of an introduction, I would say that we're not against all species reintroduction just in, in of itself. Really our view is that there are opportunities there. We're positive about increasing the biodiversity. We're positive about the ecotourism potential. We understand why a lot of people are attracted to the idea of rewilding. But we believe this all needs to be done sensitively and incrementally. I want to ask the question, what does rewilding look like to you? In Scotland, we have a fairly dry technical document that's sitting in draft form and it's called the Preliminary Assessment of Potential Conservation Translocations. Nothing like a civil servant to strip the passion out of any kind of concept. <laughs> um, this document analyses various potential species for reintroduction or reinforcement in Scotland. I should say it's in draft form, it doesn't represent the Scottish Government's views, our views, anyone else's. It's been developed by a group of stakeholders. And I want to test some of the species out on you tonight to find out whether or not you feel they represent rewilding. So I'm going to take you through a representative sample of what is on that list. And what I'd like you to do is when you feel like you, we've reached the point where we've rewilded, if you can raise your hand. Okay? So, brace yourself. First first one on the list. This is the small cow wheat. It's quite a nice looking plant. Nobody thus far, surprisingly enough, feels we've rewilded. Perhaps the narrow-headed ant will swing it for you. No? No? We have, we have some of these in Scotland already, so it's about reinforcing that population. Poor ants. Nobody's fighting for them. There we go. What about this one? The powan. It's a good looking fish. Uh, gee, it's hard, it's hard to please crowd tonight. Okay, nobody's buying the powan. What about this uh, handsome fellow, the river lamprey? Right, okay, it's going, going, going uh, worse than I thought it might be. The, the, the lamprey fans have stayed away tonight. Okay, perhaps this one will be more to your taste. The Atlantic sturgeon. Go oh, the sturgeon fans here. This is good. We've got a couple of people here. We've got a couple of people who've warmed up and feel we've, we've, we're beginning the rewilding. Actually, we've rewilded here. This is good. You know, this is a good place to be. I think this one should win a few people around. The common crane. Beautiful looking creature. Not to be found as far as I'm aware. Okay. RSPB corner of the room tonight. That's excellent. <laughs> excellent. Good. I think it's fantastic, but there's precious few people in the room. So if you can, I'm sorry, this is a real pain. If you've already put your hand up, if you can keep your hand up there, that would be really helpful. I'll, I'll whiz through the last few. You'll be fine. There'll be blood draining out of your arm. Um, so there's precious few hands up around the room. Perhaps we can uh, move on. The capper Cayley. 
pretty charismatic bird. Okay, so we have by the small cow wheat, the narrow-headed ant, the powern, the Atlantic sturgeon, the common crane, and the capercaillie for about, yeah, I don't know, 20 people in the room, maybe 25 people, we have rewilded. Bearing in mind, this is what rewilding may look like. The red squirrel. We have quite a lot of them already in certain places, but obviously there's big issues with grey squirrels. Is this what you thought you'd be hearing about tonight? Red squirrels, small cow wheat, powen, no? Okay. I think this is where most people's interest will start to be piqued. Now, I don't want you to throw your hand up straight away because I've got more for you after this one. The beaver. Gee! This is an all or nothing crowd here tonight. This is, we want it all here. Um, the beaver, you know, huge effort being spent by Johnny's organisation along there establishing the Scottish beaver trial in Argyll in the west of Scotland. If I don't get more hands in this next one, we're in trouble. The lynx. Now, can everyone who's already put their hand up keep their hand up so we can get a feel for where we are? I am surprised. I am surprised. This is, this is an enthusiastic audience here. Really what you came for is this guy. And if you don't have your hand up by now, we have a problem. You can put your hands down now. What this is really saying is, Rewilding has very quickly become associated and synonymous with charismatic species. That energizes you, but it gives other, people's con gives other people concerns, and that's not just farmers and crofters. Because whilst these are undeniably going to deliver public costs, eh, public goods rather, they come at a private cost. There is always a cost to doing this. And that cost is all, usually, I should say not always, but usually, born privately by some of the people living in some of the most economically fragile parts of the country. And many of you may be sitting there going, oh yeah, but we can, we can compensate them. That'll sort it out, compensate them. If they lose a lamb or they lose crops, or compensate them. Well, I have to say, there'll be other people in the room saying, we're not compensating them. We have a moral obligation to reintroduce this species. We wiped it out. We've got to bring it back. We can't compensate somebody for doing the right thing. The civil servants have rather more prosaic reasons for why they are a little averse to the idea of compensation. And that is the fact that I'm assuming if England, Wales and Northern Ireland, anything like Scotland, existing species management budgets are under huge pressure. So they're struggling to fund what they've already got. We have in Scotland the wildcat that's under huge pressure. We have capper Cayley, we have red squirrels. The budgets for all of these are being squeezed. So when you start throwing in beavers, and lynx and wolves, that budget has to increase, increase exponentially with each one of these. And last but not least, government doesn't give forever commitments. Compensation might be for three years, it might be for five years if you're lucky. But there's something more emotional here that I'd like to talk about. This is a quote from someone in a position of power who should have known better Speaking to a farmer had lost a lamb to a sea eagle on the west coast of Scotland. <laughs> and that, that's not, that's not respectful. You, you know, for some people it may be a statement of fact, but to most farmers and crofters it speaks of cultural imperialism. It's basically saying, your world doesn't matter as much as my world. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the path to ruination. I thought this quote was quite a nice one. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't have an issue with the word rewilding. If we think about it carefully, if we proceed uh, with uh, the kind of process that William outlined there and we plan, yes, we should carefully and incrementally reintroduce species where that's appropriate. Yes, we should try and collect reconnect individually and collectively with nature. Yes, certainly we believe, and I hope you will, 
we should encourage farmers and crofters to make space for nature and accept change, but in return receive reasonable recompense for the private costs they incur in delivering these public goods. But I have to say, there are some people out there, and many of them are on the panel tonight, who will speak in detail about rewilding and they will consider the pros and the cons and they'll think it through. But there's an awful lot of other people for whom my analogy is this little child in the sweet shop. What can I have next, mummy? Well, quick, you know, give me more, the sugar fix. That's not really a healthy way for us to proceed with rewilding. We need less romance and more pragmatism. Don't say no romance, just a little less. A bit more of that Teutonic approach that William was advocating there. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed my time in London, but I have to say, I think we need fewer debates in London and more discussions in the village halls of this country, because that's where this is going to happen. And an acceptance by all concerned that whilst they may have a point, so might the person sitting opposite them. Thank you very much. panel so far. Um, I wonder whether Dr. Paul Jepson is going to be as cautious. He directs the University of Oxford's MSc in Biodiversity, Conservation and Management. He transferred into academia from a career in conservation management and policy with periods as a local government countryside officer in the UK and as head of the BirdLife International Indonesia program. Paul leads an interdisciplinary conservation governance lab working to generate novel and creative insights to help conservation assure its relevance and impact in the 21st century. Paul. Evening, everybody. Our engagements with nature have shaped us as a people, as a united kingdom, but these engagements, of course, have also shaped the natures within which we live. Since the cultural shock of environmentalism in the 1970s and the realisation of that awful damage wrought by humanity on our natural systems, we have come to treat British nature like a granny. A beloved, interesting, but ailing granny. We cherish her personality, her insights on past times, and enjoy being with her. However, we are also protective of our granny nature. I am a supporter of rewilding because I think our society needs a family of natures. Natures that include young and exuberant members. Natures which a wider cross-section of our multicultural society will be curious, excited and challenged to engage with. Excuse me. In truth, there are already unruly natures out there, our urban titlands, for example. But in my view, the idea of creating new natures has been neglected, sometimes resisted, by our extremely well-meaning but powerful nature conservation institutions. When I'm out and about in the British countryside, I see people engaging with natures in 21st century ways, mountain biking, paragliding, coast steering, wild swimming and so forth. I'll put money on seeing drone flying becoming commonplace within the next 10 years. Compared to the days of my youth, these outdoor recreations seem more active and thrill-seeking and more lifestyle focused in terms of the kit and technology involved. This suggests to me that people are looking for something extra in British natures. I think of rewilding as a term or a label like punk or hippie, that signifies an unsettling, a desire and a need to shake up the present and move forward. In 2003, a group of students and I hired a minibus, well actually two minibuses, and drove to Holland to meet with Franz Vera. I can honestly slay, say he blew our minds. We'd never imagined a conservation vision like the one he showed us at the Oostwaardeplassen. A vision based on the idea that all natures are simulacra of past times. So why not consciously choose a past time that we wish to reproduce 
through our conservation investment. Before this trip to Amsterdam, I'd always imagined the Dutch as the engineers and the Brits as the creative types. types. Well, how about this for a bit of creative conservation thinking from our Dutch colleagues? So, we're told the auroch is extinct, 1627. Well, actually, the Dutch said, no, it's not. We've just transformed it to a cow. It's still amongst us. So, if we domesticated the cow, why can't we de-domesticate it backwards? We haven't necessarily lost the auroch. We can think about restoring what has gone past. I see rewilding as an opening, a space of creative thinking and action on future natures. For me, rewilding captures an approach to nature conservation with four guiding principles. Restoring trophic levels and an emphasis on ecosystem function, or put simply, reconstructing the food chains. This often involves restoring large mammal assemblages and, more controversially, allowing predators back in. Second, and this may be the most difficult principle, is a willingness to accept what we term non-analog species assemblages. By this I mean mixes of species other than those codified in our ecological classifications and hence considered legitimate by law and policy. Rewilding is more relaxed about having badgers, muntjacs, rabbits, buddleia and blackthorn all mixed up, so long as the system is functioning. My third principle is what I term hand-in-pocket management, a willingness to stand back and let natural systems take their own course and determine the future ecology of an area. This will result in dynamic boost, boom and bust reserves, reserves that are good for certain species one year and not another. But essentially, we can see the benefits of the Dutch boom and bust reserves here in the UK. Those of you who are enjoying little egrets, spoonbills, great white egrets, these are partly here because of the boom and bust reserves. They don't just die in the reserve, they fly off. And it's almost like this pump priming, sorry, pumping uh, dispersal. My fourth principle is what George Monbiot called rewilding the self. The idea that in modern society, with all its health and safety regulations, we need unregulated places where people can experience nature with their bodies as well as their minds. That feeling of, place, uh, of hairs standing up on your arms, the anxiety of getting lost or coming face to face with a large mammal, places where we feel more alive. At the Oxford uh, Megafauna Conference in March, I made the controversial claim that citizens of South Yorkshire had been shortchanged with the restoration of the mining landscapes of the Dern Valley. They could have had a progressive rewilding project. Instead, they received a nice but conservative RSPB-ized landscape. I think it's important to recognise that the UK is a world centre of research and teaching in the field of nature conservation. We have leadership in the potential to blend perspectives from different disciplines into a new multi-function vision for 21st century conservation. A vision to restore earth systems, assure natural assets, revitalise critical, uh, creative engagements with nature and enrich lives, culture and economy. For me, rewilding represents a first call for action towards a new vision. What I believe we need is large-scale experimental rewilding projects involving government, university and enterprise. The Dutch did this nearly 30 years ago, and in the last 10 years, a small number of UK landowners have started their own rewilding experiments. I think it's time we, as a United Kingdom, act more strategically collectively and ambitiously in shaping a future nature. As a nation, we have the space for rewilding without upsetting or euthanizing granny nature. Spaces can be found in our post-industrial landscapes, green belts, marginalized ag agriculture, and uplands. So my message is this. Let us create a British nature that's a bit more edgy, unpredictable, and in your face. Dare I say, more spectacular. Let us broaden our nature conservation investment portfolio to include higher risk, higher return 
conservation assets. Thank you. So Paul would like to encourage us all to be just a little bit wilder. But what about Johnny Hughes, who is CEO of the Scottish Wildlife Trust, an environmental charity that's dedicated to conserving the wildlife and natural environment of Scotland. Before being appointed Chief Executive, Johnny was the Trust's Director of Conservation, where he oversaw the Scottish Beaver Trial, a project which resulted in the first ever reintroduction of an extinct mammal back into the UK. Johnny is also an elected global councillor of the IUCN, the world's oldest and largest conservation organisation. Johnny. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming in such great numbers. Um, I'd also like to thank Earthwatch for putting on this uh, magnificent debate. And I'd also like to thank Andrew as well for showing... Um, all the species that the Scottish Wildlife Trust has been working on for many, many years. Um, almost all of them, in fact, um, apart from the wolf, which um, we, we haven't started working on yet. We have done a bit of um, some, some investigations into, into, into lynx ecology in Europe um, with, with a view to potentially um, having a campaign to bring them back into Scotland, but I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, I'd also like to thank Paul as well for, for defining rewilding in his talk, and maybe we should have done that in the beginning before you voted on it, but... It's a little bit late, late now. But, um, so, we're, we're living through an unprecedented period of human history. The United Nations estimate that there'll be 9.6 billion people on the Earth by 2050. Um, in the UK, the population is predicted to reach well over 70 million, uh, by that time putting extra pressure on our already stressed natural ecosystems. Perhaps, um, and I say perhaps for a number of reasons, the growth in population is likely to be very uneven across the world. Africa's population will more than double, for example. Um, while in European countries we may see a fall. I must remember to use the clicker. I've been told this by the... I've been briefed on this. Um, there is also, also likely to be very large movements of people as ecosystems in, in some places collapse due to the effects of climate change um, and what might be called um, natural capital asset stripping. But there are two trends that could give us some comfort um, and some comfort to those hoping that there will still be corners of this earth and of Britain which will remain wild and indeed could become rewilded. The first is urbanisation. Currently globally 54% of people live in urban areas. By 2050 this will be 66%. So whilst the world's population is growing steadily, the rural population may drop in many areas leading to land abandonment, uh, for which, for, 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 for many people, that is actually very closely linked to rewilding. I realize not all, because definitions do vary. The other big, potentially game-changing trend is the emergence of so-called sustainable intensification in food production systems. Now, I say food production systems rather than agriculture, as whether we like it or not. The boom in smart mechanization, new techniques for growing protein, and the application of synthetic biology could render many of our traditional agricultural systems economically marginal, even with the current levels of high and highly distorting rates of public subsidies paid to farmers. These trends are critical to understand in any debate on rewilding. People have used the land for food production, hunting, foraging for centuries on almost every corner of Earth. We may now be facing the prospect that a combination of urbanization and technology will start to reverse this trend and indeed um, we saw from Christina that this is actually happening in parts of Northern America. So, ironically then, the big driver for rewilding may not be environmental policy per se, or even public opinion, but the forces of capitalism, however one may feel about the pros and cons of our current prevailing economic system. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate, to an extent at least. Even the best futurologists would admit that it's probably pretty difficult to predict what impact for good or ill these global megatrends will have on our ecosystems. And there are many variables. Will these new te technologies be acceptable to society? What will the future demand for red meat and other high uh, ecological impact foods be in the future? But let's be optimistic for a minute and say that rewilding might well be possible, even on a planet with 10 billion plus people. So that, that partly answers the question, 
is rewilding realistic, which I think it was important to get out of the way, uh, I'd li now like to try and answer the question of why before coming on to the how. The rationale for rewilding cuts to the heart of why the nature conservation movement exists in the first place. Many, but not all, humans have an empathy with nature. They inherently feel a sense of responsibility to care for other species for their intrinsic value. It remains a moot point as to whether this is a truly altruistic act or whether our deeper motivation is to receive some spiritual or psycholo uh, psychological benefit from doing so. And if biophilia exists, then perhaps we're all genetically hardwired to respect nature anyway. But what about those in our tribes that don't much care for nature? Those will happily destroy a species or a habitat for personal gain. The uncomfortable truth is uh, that we are those people. 99% of those in the audience today will have a mobile phone in their pockets, thankfully they're all switched off, with metals mined out of large holes in the ground by Glencore or Rio Tinto or BHP Billiton or one of the other mega mining companies. Quite a few of us here eat red meat more times in a week than is probably good for our own health, never mind the health of the planet. Now, if we find it hard to change, how can we persuade the average minister in government, dreaming every night about how to grow GDP, to create the conditions for rewilding to become a reality? The fact is, to have any chance of seeing rewilding happen on the scale required to reverse biodiversity loss, we need to marshal other arguments. And not just, and I stress the not just, because we're not abandoning this by any means, rely on its the morally right thing to do line. We need to convince our elected representatives to legislate effectively so that corporations and landowners cannot continue to generate private profits by running up a massive natural capital debt which they have no intention on paying back. This means spelling out the full gamut of benefits that will come from rewilding. For example, in those areas where farming is economically marginal, we need to provide opportunities for farmers to diversify into new businesses based on ecotourism and other enterprises. Perhaps using some of the 3.5 billion euros provided to farmers in the UK every year under the Common Agricultural Policy. 3.5 billion euros that was, by the way. Um, we also need to make visible all those other benefits of nature currently invisible in, in, in economic decision making, including flood mitigation, carbon sequestration and storage in our peatlands and our woodlands, improvements in water quality and the protection of species and gene genetic diversity on which we depend for our medicines, materials, new breeds of animal and, and, and strains of crops. None of this negates or conflicts with the need for the moral case. Both cases are needed and absolutely should be made. The World Forum of Natural Capital held in Edinburgh last uh, November brought together professionals from across the world to explore practical ways of making the value of nature more visible in economic decision making. A second World Forum will follow in November in 2015. And I'm hopeful that real, potentially transformational progress that will be made, will be made in this area in the coming decade. So what about the how? How should we go about rewilding and what or could rewilded landscapes look like? The Scottish Wildlife Trust vision is for healthy, resilient ecosystems across large areas of Scotland's land and seas. That's enshrined in our, 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 our vision statement, which we wrote 10 years ago. This is effectively a rewilding vision, although I appreciate that definitions of the term do vary considerably, and, and we'll probably pick that up in the panel discussion. As a trust, we're already putting this vision into action through our living landscape projects, the largest of which is the Coyac Ascent Living Landscape Pro Program, or CALL for short, a 50-year partnership project in northwest Scotland to restore the ecosystem health of the area, but equally as importantly, to generate socio-economic benefits for the local communities. One of the indicators of, of the success of this project uh, is whether the local schools are still open and alive with children in 50 years' time. The core project area is around 60,000 hectares involving eight adjacent landowning partners, two of which are environmental charities, ourselves and the John Muir Trust, two community-owned holdings, very large community buyouts, four private estates. We think this is a model uh, of working towards share go shared goals over the long term. is a very, very practical way of achieving good outcomes for both the environment and the community. The Scottish Wildlife Trust groundbreaking Scottish Beaver Trail took the same approach. The five-year trial simply would not have been the huge success it was had we not meaningfully connected the project with the community and, and, and local livelihoods. To sum up then, at the Scottish Wildlife Trust, we want to see ecosystem health restored across large areas of Scotland, including 
the return of extinct keystone species such as the Eurasian lynx. I'm comfortable with calling this mission rewilding in certain contexts, so long as there is a place for people. As I've said in several previous presentations, the living in living landscapes includes people and not just wildlife. And I'd add that we're not just talking here about Gore-Tex clad walkers observing and rambling in the landscape. I'm talking about people living and working in these landscapes in a way which is compatible with year-on-year -year improvements in the health of those ecosystems. Soil, water, biodiversity and natural processes being, being the bedrock of, of that health. Now that might include extensive farming systems. After all, wood pasture, which is, uh, I noticed Keith Kirby's in the audience today. Um, after all, wood, wood pasture is one of our rarest and our richest habitats in the UK, and it's nothing if not anthropogenic. It might or perhaps should include hunting and fishing. The trick to bringing people with us, and we're going to need to do that if we're going to um, realise this rewilding vision, is to combine ecological recovery with economic vitality in rural areas. It can be done, and even urban areas actually, it can be done. Indeed, we've made a pretty good start. The challenge now is scaling it up. So once again, we see Atlantic woodlands stretching uninterrupted from the Mull of Kintyre to Sandwood Bay, or the drained and horribly conifer-scarred flow country of Caithness and Sutherland return to its rightful place as the great boggy wilderness of Northern Britain. Um, and I'll end there and just to say thank you. And by the way, you, you don't have to live in Scotland to become a member of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. You can. <laughs> I just I just wanted to end on that point. It's not. So you've heard now from all five of our speakers uh, some interesting views, uh, some recurrent themes. Uh, I think most of our speakers feel that you know, rewilding really can only uh, be successful if people are properly engaged and considered. Um, I was interested that actually uh, it was only Johnny who really talked about food and the need, the pressures on our land, particularly with increased population and climate change, of how we are going to produce food and is that going to be in conflict with rewilding. Uh, William and Andrew both have uh, it seems a fairly cautious approach to the idea. Um, William's engineering brain uh, would like to see rewilding, I think, but done uh, in a, a very, very scientific uh, way with models and uh, trials before the wolves are really allowed out of the cage. Um, and Andrew uh, likes the idea of rewilding maybe with some wheatgrass. <laughs> but perhaps nothing too red in tooth and claw. But let's now uh, let the panel discuss amongst themselves. They've all been taking furious notes. So um, who would like to start? Christina, do you have any, uh, any, any issues that you'd like to take up with your fellow panelists? Um, we have learned some hard lessons in North America about rewilding. Currently, we have um, recovered the populations of many of the large carnivores and beavers um, and other keystone species in North America in the West. And we have not, um, we have not come to an understanding. The battle lines are still drawn between people involved in agriculture and hunters and the conservation community with managers caught in the middle between that. So now, legally, that we've recovered species like uh, grizzly bears, for example, um, per our recovery plans that are federal, um, we are uncertain about what to do next. And the plans that are on the table right now calls for reducing the populations of these uh, keystone species down to the lowest possible level, short of extinction, in order to minimize conflict with human communities. So we do not know what our next steps are going to be. In the US, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits. Um, and so I would like to ask the rest of the panel, what are their thoughts on how such 
acrimony might be prevented, avoided in the UK as part of that rewilding process. Andrew. Yeah, go on, yeah. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is obviously key to where I think m most of the farming community will be on this issue. It's about accepting that if you are going to bring these species back, you're going to manage them. That's where I think Paul and I would probably disagree. Um, we live in a highly uh, engineered, uh, as, as William described it, environment in this country. Even the far reaches of Scotland have a human population on there far in excess of what Christina has in her backyard. So if you're going to bring these species back, if you want to minimise, I'm not saying you can eliminate the conflict with the agricultural community, but if you want to minimise it, they need to have the confidence that you're going to respect their views, that you're going to manage that population. You're not simply going to say, well, it's nature, let's just let it rip and deal with the consequences. And that you're going to be there for the long term. Um, we have a history in Scotland with sea eagles where for, they were reintroduced in 1975 and for a large part of that time farmers' concerns about the impact of sea eagles on their sheep flocks were denied. And really over the last 10 years that denial has been watered down to the point where we are now really just beginning to have an adult grown-up discussion with both sides of the debate and saying yes there is an issue, yes there's populations here to stay, we're going to respect each other's point of view and we're going to find a way to coexist and we're not simply going to say that's nature, it's back, deal with it, you're on your own. So that, you know, there's no kind of uh, snappy overnight answer to this, it's, it's, it's hard work, it's, uh, it's thrashing a lot of really difficult issues out um, and showing respect for both sides. Paul just wants to pick up on something, but can I just ask very quickly, Andrew, um, you know, there are farming communities all over the world that do farm livestock alongside big predators. I've worked with many of them, um, and they manage it by understanding the wildlife, they're understanding the foe, if you like, and some of them will even understand that having big predators uh, as part of their ecosystem can be an advantage to the way that they farm. What, I mean, can you not see a way that farmers uh, could adapt in the future to allow them to work alongside predators? Is it just farmers being a bit stuck in their ways? We already have that situation where farmers are having to adapt. That exists in the west coast of Scotland with the sea eagle population that's there. They're having to deal with that. It exists in Tayside where an illegally released beaver population is now numbering probably close to 200. Farmers are already adapting to it. They're not necessarily happy about how that situation, particularly the Tayside one, but even if you look back to the sea eagle, the early stage of the sea eagle one, they're not happy about having got to that point, but they are dealing with it. I think it's not about saying that they, they can't countenance living alongside these creatures. I think they can, in provided certain safeguards are put in place. And nobody's yet been willing to give them those long-term assurances. And I, I think the respect point that Christina has raised is absolutely critical. You've got to respect these people. Also, you've got to, you know... To be brutally honest, you know, as I said, there's a, there's a private cost to these public goods, and we've got to face up to that. But surely, you know, a lot of farmers, um, uh, certainly farmers that I know and work alongside, would think of themselves, and proudly think of themselves, as guardians of the countryside. But could they not be guardians of a, you know, a wilder, better functioning countryside? Are they yeah, not I th just I think guardians yeah. of something that's over-engineered and, and, and not real? The, the, you know, we are, we are talking, as William said earlier on, about countrysides that have developed over centuries, if not millennia. And, you know, I think it would be pretty hard for most people in this room to adapt to having wolves in their backyard over the space of a few months or a few years. This is, this is stuff that takes time. This is, you know... I. Yes, I think there is potential there, but it's, it's, it's sensitive stuff and needs to be handled carefully. Let me bring Paul in. Yeah, I've never uh, quite imagined rewilding as just letting everything go 
uh, into the countryside. I suppose I'd always, or so far, I've thought about it more in terms of, of an addi addition and a complementary reserve system. You know, this is what I was trying to get at in the point of, uh, of experimental uh, reserves. And, you know, um, there's some really nice examples of rewilding in, in Holland, which seems to work, uh, not with wolves involved, I have to say, but uh, with the large mammal uh, herbivore assemblages at areas of 350 hectares. So this is quite, you know, similar to sort of some of the larger RSPB reserves are out there. So I think what I'd imagined is that we would do rewilding as a complementary, a new type of reserve system where we could start, you know, debating the issues around it, learning how it worked, uh, sensitising ourselves to it. Whereas I think if we talk about the idea of rewilding, of you know, just letting wolves out, I mean, of course it will cause uh, uh, great concern. I, really like, I was really interested, though, also in this, this idea of um, uh, public goods at private cost and this idea that uh, you know, predators out there will cause a cost to farmers. Well, for me, I thought that we, as I understood it, a good mechanism to deal with that was insurance, that uh, it will be another risk to farming and it can be dealt with through insurance, and it would probably be quite a low insurance premium. Um, um, you should talk to the NFU about that. Farming insurance is horrendous. <laughs> but, come on, what, what, what is the risk? Public of, liability insurance What would the risk of getting your sheep killed by a wolf be? I think your, pre your Adam would be quite low for that. You're not dealing with a rational approach when you're looking at your insurance ideas. I mean, insurance companies are anything but rational and risk perception like that. What you need, what you need and, and I, I, all joking aside, I appreciate the point, but I think the, the issue that you have to, have to deal with is how you're going to monitor it, how you're going to deal with that risk, how you're going to quantify that risk, how you're going to make it palatable. And I think the point that um, Andrew was making there is that the farmer can, can deal with it, uh, the, the farmer can handle the fact that there are other animals around, that there is wildness, that there is wilderness or going to be a more wild environment, as long as there is some kind of mechanism there for maintaining a, a level of control. If you let those pastures go out, if you let things go, and you have your, your citing the Dutch environment, it's fabulous, works in Holland, until they come over the border. Now, the animals don't understand borders. The animals don't understand the edge between a reserve, you're working in parks, well, you're going to set fire in a park or you're going to have uh, wolves in your park, unless you're going to put up a big fence around it that's somehow wolf-proof. You need some way of being able to quantify what the risk is and then be able to respond quickly, and this is the other point that Andrew's making, you need to be able, in any system, whatever you're going to do for your control, you need for your process variable, you're going to measure what's going on, you need some way to be able to deal with it if it gets out of control. And that's, I think, the fear that we see there. And I, I, mean, I'm sorry, I have to say, I think we fundamentally differ here. I mean, the idea that we can, uh, we can control nature, that we n can know enough about natural systems to control it. I mean, maybe part of the reason we have impoverished, impoverished systems at the moment is because we have tried to control them uh, so much. I think for me, it's the idea of living within the planet and starting to live within and with natural systems, not trying to over-control it, and to having those places which are you know, freely functioning uh, places uh, within our um, living environments. But let's just pick up what Christina uh, just said at the beginning of this part of the discussion. Um, I'm going to state the bleeding obvious here. North America is an awfully lot bigger than the UK. Uh, North America has a lot more wild land and a lot less people per uh, square mile in, in certain areas. I know there are some areas that are very densely populated, but the areas that have, by the sounds of things, been rewilded successfully or have brought back these, uh, these car big carnivore species successfully um, don't have a huge amount of people in it. I would imagine, Christina, I don't know, when we talk about risk and we talk about uh, the effect on things like livestock or potentially people, you know, if people are worried about being attacked by a wolf, I know it's extremely rare, if not unheard of, but, you know, let's deal very quickly with what is the risk in your situation, in a situation where you've got a lot more land and a lot less people? So... I started studying wolves because I started having wolves running through my backyard, literally, and everything changed. And I had young children. And um, I have worked very closely as a scientist in the field with carnivores, not just wolves, grizzly bears, uh, pumas, and there's, 
there's the, the danger to humans is negligible. The issue in living peacefully with these large carnivores is you have to realize that they're bigger and stronger than you are and lose your arrogance as a, as a species and live more on their terms. That's a lot simpler to do than most people think. Um, depredation, which means a carnivore killing livestock, is negligible. Um, for example, in Oregon, there are um, nine wolf packs. They've been present there for about um, five years. During that period, um, there's 1.3 million head of cattle in the area where the wolves are, and those wolves have um, taken, killed, 27 head of cattle during that period. However, the ranchers are pretty upset about what they consider a depredation problem. The big issue is sheep. So wolves do not depredate on cattle. It's, highly, it's really rare. But what happens with sheep is when sheep are approached by wolves, and most packs wouldn't approach a, pack, a, a group of sheep, but when they do approach sheep, the sheep become hysterical they're small, they start running around in circles making sounds, and some packs of wolves go into this instinctive attack mode. And so the main conflicts we've had in North America have to do with sheep. In Europe, in the European Union, there is a high amount of depredation by wolves on sheep. And this is subsidized, so the, um, the farmer is paid for those losses. Most of these are farmers that use guard dogs already, that have small farms, that spend a lot of time with their livestock. So they're being responsible in their management practices. They're not just turning out their sheep blindly and you know, leaving them be and then picking them up at the end of the season. So depredation is, is something that needs to be addressed when you're dealing with wolves. When you're dealing with something like a lynx, it's a lot simpler. There, there are no recorded instances in North America of lynx depredating on sheep or on cattle. But then again, that is a very different system than the one that you have here. So I think we can learn from the many mistakes we've made in North America and what we've learned, the things that we've done right. Um, but this is a very different system. It's much smaller and you're going to have to come together, in my opinion, and talk to each other across this spectrum of perspectives and find solutions that, as, as we have been discussing, as William brought up, are suited to this landscape. So, and I don't know what those solutions are gonna be. Let's open it up to you. Has anybody got any questions for our panel? Yes, gentlemen here. Okay, just uh, for those of you who may not have uh, heard the question, uh, this gentleman has said, uh, why has only Scotland been mentioned and not England, Ireland and Wales as far as places to uh, undertake rewilding? And why has none of the panel mentioned uh, things like the wild boar populations in the Forest of Dean and, uh, and Tunbridge Wells? Um, I didn't know about that one, I know about the Forest of Dean one, um, uh, that apparently have happened naturally or possibly just escapees that have then rewilded happily. South Yorkshire is in England. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> well done. But, but, but seriously, um, I mean, the point of wild boar, I think, um, you know, personally, I think wild boar would be a great thing to... Uh, uh, rewild or reintroduce. Um, I know it causes problems and it's a difficult thing to control, but its role in, in you know, as an ecosystem engineer, I think is well recognized. And that's, that's you using the words that I was going to use. You talked there about a wild boar being something that's difficult to control, and you talked about it being an ecosystem engineer. And, I mean, yes, why didn't we talk about England? Uh, we could have. 
we could have picked examples from anywhere. Um, did. The, and you did. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. We did. We, we used examples from North America, from Europe, from, from England, and from Scotland. Yeah. Um, and I think probably, you know, the, the, the focus on Scotland is because there's two people from the panel from Scotland, which probably makes a bit of a change down here. Um, <laughs> But, 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 also, but, but also because we have had the first reintroduction of an extinct mammal back into the wild um, for the first time ever in the UK, and it happened in Scotland. So I think that's yeah. it. Well, yeah, it's the, the one example we've got. Come on. <laughs> at least, at least um, the, the point is we could, have, we could have picked examples from anywhere, and we did. We picked from all over the world. We could have gone to the southern, the southern hemisphere as well. Uh, the, the question is, is quite valid. Uh, but all of the examples, all of the lessons, everything that, that we've spoken about, we could apply just as easily to any system where you have a, uh, a conflict, a challenge, an interaction between uh, the needs of the engineered environment, of the built environment, of the, of the footprint of that built environment, namely the agricultural land that provides the food, that provides the resources into the cities that are growing, all of that requirement is only going to get more and more um, difficult. Uh, so what we need to do is to understand what the parameters are, what the demands are going to be, uh, and really model it, really understand it, so that we can, and look as many systems as we can across the planet uh, to be able to find the inspiration we need to look at local problems. And I think the story you were saying about what we need to do is get out of this room and walk into town halls. We need to go and talk to people in local areas. We need to understand the local problems. And you're quite right. I mean, yes, oh, Yorkshire aside, uh, we, could, we could talk about any part of England. We need to get out there, and we, right, the community, need to get out there and get these conversations happening at grassroots level. That's the only way it's going to work. Yes. Uh, that's probably, um, yes, do you want to answer that, Sue? Do you want to come up, come up to the microphone? So um, Earthwatch works with lots of scientists and conservation managers. Oh, sorry, good point. <laughs> the lady here just said that um, George Monbiot, who's been mentioned a couple of times, um, has made a significant contribution to the debate on rewilding. Re um, as many of you know, and, and asked why um, he wasn't included. Um, and, and I was just explaining that, you know, because Earthwatch works with scientists and um, conservation practitioners, conservation managers, that's kind of where we turn when we're putting a debate together because we want a, a range of voices and a range of, of expertise. So when we, when we put the debate together, we wanted the scientists, conservation um, practitioners that we work with, but we did invite all journalists, lots of journalists, and we invited George to um, come along. Um, and uh, hopefully he is um, watching online um, and, and listening to the debate, but he has made a great contribution himself. Yes, gentleman in the, in the red jacket. So far, nobody's mentioned the economics of this, and nor has anybody mentioned the whole habitat values at stake. And yet there are tremendous things going on in the financial market through natural capital valuation that mean there are big corporate forces bringing big money into revaluing these natural capital assets. Isn't this going to open up a big opportunity for this kind of new world? So um, just to pray see that question, uh, the, the um, markets that are, or the, the sort of financial input into natural assets could be uh, a great opportunity for rewilding uh, that uh, uh, good habitats, I hope I'm saying this sort of well enough, but uh, good healthy habitats, wild environments uh, can improve economics in uh, certain areas. Are we missing a trick? I, I, did, I did mention natural capital um, twice. and um, <laughs> Sorry, but I, I also said that I'm hopeful that real, potentially transformational progress will be made in this, in this area in the coming decade, and I agree with you. Um, I just wanted to say something about the economics, because I, I did talk about it in my, in my, in my talk. Um, the common agricultural policy uh, currently is 42% of the European Union budget. Now, the output of the agricultural industry in, 
in the UK is 1.5% of GDP. So, and, and that's it's, it's, it's slightly lower than the European average. So you've got 42 percent of the European budget go, going into, in, into subsidies for, a, for an industry which is normally less than about 3 percent. Now, I know Andrew's going to come back and say that there are probably other so, socioeconomic reasons for propping up agriculture in, 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 in rural communities, um, apart from just the money, the money factor. But if, if, we could, if we could use some of that 42% and 3.5 billion, which is spent in the UK every year, to secure a, a broader range of public benefits, one of which might, might be rewilding, wouldn't that make more sense than actually trying to you know, keep a system limping on, which is, I mean, sheep farming in, in, in Scotland is, is a very, very expensive way of producing one kilo of protein. It's a very, very expensive. And it's only really kept going because of public subsidies. Why don't we use those public subsidies, your money, your taxpayers' money, all the people sitting here that want rewilding, to, to actually do something different in, in, in particularly the uplands of the UK? Um, that doesn't mean to say a complete halt in food production systems, but it does mean um, a more vibrant landscape which is alive with, 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 with nature. Um, a much better place, I, 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 would, I would think, to, 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 to live uh, within these British Isles, whilst at the same time, you know, actually in, in injecting some vibrancy into the rural economy. Andrew? Um, yeah, there's just a couple of points I'd like to address there. Yeah, the common agricultural policy costs a lot of money, but we would absolutely defend it, and we would defend it on a number of fronts. Uh, not all of that money goes in direct support, a large percentage of it goes towards agri-environment funding. But if you do look at the direct, if you look at the Pillar 1 payments, uh, you know, I, I think if you were to speak to your grandparents and your great-grandparents and ask them how much of their income they spent on food, they would tell you a percentage that you probably couldn't even conceive of. We spend less on our food now than I think we have. Well, I know the prices have gone up recently, but you know, we, we are getting a return on that investment every time we go and buy our food. Now, I'd like to see less of that money going into the coffers of the supermarkets. I'd like to see more of it staying with farmers. That's, you know, that's one of the problems there is you know, that a lot of that money does end up in the supermarkets' pockets. Um, but these are, you know, this, this, is the, this is the messiness of this situation. It's not simply the case that the money goes to the farmers, the farmers sort of fritter it away doing uh, outmoded things. They're doing their absolute level best. And Johnny um, mentioned about the sheep farming. Yes, if you look at uh, just straight input versus output, you would never do sheep farming. You would never touch it with a barge pole. But if you look at human edible input versus human edible output, I, what can you produce on grass that you can then eat? Nothing can top sheep farming. And actually, if you speak to the climate scientists, they'll tell you that the UK is going to become more, not less, important in terms of global agriculture as climate change takes hold. And really what you're trying to do here is produce the red meat that the developing world needs because they're not getting enough in the most efficient way possible because that developing world is not going to be able to produce what it produces at the moment, never mind more to deal with its growing population. So, you know... I think it's a, it's a bit of a low blow to say if we just took the money away, the direct support away from agriculture, or we took, we took more of it away that we'd get more value out of the system. You need economic businesses in these places. You know, everyone knows the phrase, you can't be green when you're in the red. You know, we've got to make farming work in these places and then look at how we can integrate that with re uh, rewilding if that's what people want. Paul. Yeah, sometimes uh, it seems to me when we talk about natural capital, we immediately talk about economy and then money. And I wonder whether we might be, do better talking about natural assets, thinking about places, maybe rewilded places, which if we were investing in these places, they would generate multiple forms uh, of value. Maybe forms of value in terms of brand and regional identity, you know, sense of place. Some of the value I was talking about in terms of health and recreation. Uh, rural urban flows, I mean, places you would want to go to. You'd want to leave the city and go to these uh, places. I think that these forms of value which we get out of assets, this is where the economies emerge from because entrepreneurs or people will see ways of making uh, money in there. I mean, we're already seeing um, uh, quite a sh shift in engagements with 
with, with traditional nature through the rise of, of digital photography and the rise of guiding and uh, sort of trophy photography coming, coming up. So my feeling is that rather than doing natural capital economy money jobs, we should think of you know, capital investment in natural assets which will generate multiple forms of value which multiple people in society can capture. Christina. I would like to uh, talk about a project in Alberta that is an example of building natural capital and industry coming in and greatly supporting the rewilding. So um, I was, for my doctoral work, I was part of the Southwest Alberta Montaigne Ecology Project. Um, Shell Canada uh, gave several million dollars for a team of scientists, and I was fortunate enough to be one of those scientists, to study what rewilding means in a rural community. The national park in which I conduct my ecological experiments um, involving wolves and fire, so setting the system on fire, the forest on fire, which is a natural force there, and then observing what two wolf packs do to, in response to the fire, predation risk, and elk, the ecology of fear, as it's called. Um, well, immediately outside the park is nothing but ranch lands, and not just ranch lands, but impoverished ranch lands, impoverished ecologically, impoverished financially. Most of those families have been ranching for three or four generations at least. And so what happened is when Shell gave this, um, this, these funds for research, the Nature Conservancy stepped in, the Canadian uh, provincial government stepped in, and they created a huge program to work with the ranchers to help them find a way to live more sustainably with these apex predators that included grizzly bears as well, that were revitalizing the system ecologically. And the, I should add that for most of this project, wolves have never been protected. Grizzly bears got some protection in 2008. Um, and the reason that these carnivores are on the ground is because the ranchers choose to coexist with them. In order for that to happen, one of the things that I've done is I've had ranchers joining me as volunteers on my wolf project every year. Some of them come every year and participate. They love that landscape and they understand how it works far better than I do. So I pick their brains, I ask them for advice, and I have, through their insights that they've given me, greatly benefited as a scientist. So it's about building community and treating each other as equals respectfully and not making judgments. And what I found is that the ranching community, the agricultural community has responded beautifully. But it does take a village. It takes nonprofit organizations, industry, scientists being open and humble, and, and provincial administrators not just supplying the money, but creating this, this safe environment to address these tough conservation problems. So now we have lots of grizzly bears roaming on ranch lands. The ranch lands are in much better health. Their soil has been improved via trophic cascades. And I can't say that everybody's happy, but people are, have rewilded that system, and it's been voluntary. So there's no laws that have forced this to happen. We've got time for one more question. Yes, gentleman at the back. Yes, you. Okay, very interesting question. So uh, this gentleman has said that we're talking about reintroducing species that were once endemic in the UK, um, but in the face of our, climate cha uh, of our changing climate, should we be thinking of uh, reintroducing uh, perhaps more uh, exotic species? Although I will say, um, uh, certainly if you read John George Monbiot's book, he talks about the fact that uh, um, hippos were found uh, underneath Trafalgar Square. So um, we have had our share of, of uh, what we would call more exotic and tropical species. Andrew. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been quite fortunate to spend the last 24 hours with most of the people on the panel debating these issues in, in a lot of detail. 
And I think there's a bit of a developing joke going between us all. Uh, you know, it depends. You know, you can't make sweeping statements. What, what is the species and where are you going to put it? You just, uh, it, it, it will always depend. It's always context dependent. So maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. But, uh, you know, we sh you know it's, uh, it needs to be done sensitively. And I don't think we should confuse doing things sensitively, incrementally, carefully with uh, a sort of lack of interest or lack of enthusiasm. I hate the word passion. It gets overused. But, you know, just because you're moving slowly doesn't mean that you're not really, in, you know, doing something good and, and re-engaging with people's souls. There's, you know, in America, the managers are the ones that are proceeding carefully, doing all the, you know, the hard work behind the, behind the scenes, changing things. But Andrew, the general yes. public's out there enjoying it. You know, there are issues, but, you know, but Andrew, the question was, um, and I'm going to ask Paul to pick up on this um, now, the question was, should we be actually thinking about reintroducing species that are not and have never been perhaps endemic to the UK? Paul, what do you think? I'm not sure about that. I think the way I would, uh, or the pitch I'd like to put, is why don't we reintroduce a form of a species which we've lost from the UK, which is the opportunity for people in the UK to know cattle and horses as the social herd animal which they actually are. We ha we've had that extinction of that experience for goodness knows how long. And your point on climate change, there is some uh, work from Russia that maybe if we have these large herbivores, they do create a, something of a buffer against climate change. Because as it gets warmer, you know, the grass grows more and they eat it down, there's more biomass and as it gets colder. So they, they act as something of a buffer. So I think that that's something we could do uh, now, and it wouldn't be too radical to do, it wouldn't cause some of the tensions we're talking about, and it'd be an absolutely fascinating thing to have in Britain, you know, wild living cattle and horses. There are fairly wild horses on the Welsh hills, yeah. I'll say. They do, they do run as, uh, as traditional herds with a, with a stallion and a matriarchal mare. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know anywhere in the UK where I can go and stand next to a stallion herd and watch it watch it happening. Come to Wales. Okay, William. I'll be there. I've, I have tried it in the New Forest. I haven't quite found it there. <laughs> William. I think in answer to your question is we're already doing that. Um, and that's, that's the problem. We're introducing very large numbers of species into this environment um, pretty much every day. And if you look at, at introduced species and, and what happens when you start playing that game, um, you're not rewilding something. Now you're, what are you doing? You're wilding it? I, you're adding in a species and introduce species into something and you can drag examples from all over the planet where, again, coming back to the same idea, you've got a very carefully organized, very carefully balanced environment um, which has either been done by nature or it's been done by uh, human involvement. And then you start adding in new species. If you're going to add in ones that are you know, known to be part of that environment, that were part of it, uh, that's one kettle of fish, if you like. But the other um, introduction of species in the marine world, in the rivers, think of the zebra mussels, think of any of the, the um, purple loosestrife, think of any of the introduced plants that have caused major, major, major change in environments uh, because they got out of control. And so you've got this balanced system. At the moment, we don't have predators in this one, I mean, the big predators. We've got some, we've got little ones that are able to keep that system going. But if you start introducing an animal who doesn't have a predator at all, or introduce a plant that doesn't have any kind of control, whether it's a parasitoid or something else, uh, you then run into a situation where that'll get out of control. And we've had that time and time and time again. So I think to actually go that direction, I think your, your question is, is, a, is a very interesting one, given the changes that are going to come. Um, I think to do that kind of change, uh, we need to do an awful lot more thinking and some very careful consideration of not introducing a single species. That's an interesting concept into itself. But a suite of species, now you're really playing with the system. Uh, so, so I think that, it, although it's an interesting concept and, and it, will, it will happen anyway, right, as the climate changes, um, it's one I would be a little careful about uh, and, and I don't think it's part of this discussion, but it's one we can have in a bigger sense. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are out of time. Uh, many thanks to our panel. I think 
if uh, tonight has proved or concluded anything, it is that this is a subject that will be uh, in many people's minds for a very, very long time. There does seem to be uh, no clear-cut uh, answer to whether rewilding is something that is a good, bad, or a possible thing. Um, but I am going to ask you now, uh, I'm going to ask you actually two questions because I think um, I'd like to know first of all uh, your answer to my original question um, before you heard uh, the arguments from our panel, which was who is still in favor of rewilding? Okay, that was sort of what I expected. Now what I would like to ask you is how many people really believe that rewilding, or even the beginning of real rewilding, is possible in our lifetime? How lovely to be in a room full of optimists. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much indeed for coming. I would like now to bring up Professor David MacDonald, CBE, who's a zoologist and conservationist, and his interest in ecological research is relevant to solving practical problems of wildlife conservation and environmental management. He's the director of the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, Wild Crew, at the University of Oxford, which he founded in 1986. David is a close friend of and was formerly a chairman of Earthwatch, both for Europe and internationally, and is currently Chair Emeritus. David. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when you have a panel of this distinction, a chairman so engaged, an audience so informed, the role of a summariser is, to say the least, a bit perilous. There might be nothing left to say. However, I've thought of half a dozen quick points in the course of the evening, which I hope add just tiny seeds that may germinate in your mind on the way home, or more particularly on the way to the bar. They're sort of as follows. Point one, shifting baselines seem to me to be terribly important to almost everything we've heard this evening. When we look at wilderness and think about nature and what it is we want or might want to retain or return to, how far back in time do we go? How deteriorated are the ecosystems we're trying to preserve right now already? Do we need to go further back? I've just come back, very privileged to say so, from Southeast Asia, where I was looking at future study areas, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And in a forest block in the north of Peninsula Malaysia, near the Thai border, I came across lovely big fruits. One was called the elephant fruit. It was called elephant fruits because it was adapted to be dispersed by elephants. But in that forest, there were no more elephants. What is going to happen to those fruits and their dispersal and the ecosystem built around that system? In the same forests, we were there to look at projects on clouded leopards as the top predator. The top predator now, formerly, on top of them there had been the tiger, now gone in those forests. So we're already looking at ecosystems that have often been changed. Think more close to home. How many of the trees and shrubs in Western Europe and in this country that we seek to understand actually evolved in the Pleistocene to be browsed by elephants or similar things and are now living in a world different to that which they may originally have been adapted to. So naturalness is a tricky thing and it's come up again and again either explicitly or implicitly in what the speakers have said about exactly what are we trying to go back to, how do we decide. Uh, point one. Point two, let me commend to you if I may Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty was the person who wisely observed that when I use a word, it means precisely what I wish it to mean and neither more nor less. So defining words is important and I think it's more than pedantry to say that here this evening, amongst the speakers, there's no implied criticism here, each of them has said interesting things, but different aspects of what might broadly be called rewilding has been spoken about. A lot of what you heard about this evening was in fact much about just general conservation. 
some of it was about reintroduction of species which were once somewhere um, and might be brought back. Some of it was about restocking or fortifying populations that are now imperil perilously rare but might be uh, made larger again and therefore perhaps more resilient and more functional. And some of it um, nudged towards what is often thought to be at the essence of specifically rewilding, which is not only putting back species, but trying to put back the processes, the ecological processes, of which those species were once a part. So I just, I think, and I doubt anybody would dissent on the panel, um, that there is more than pedantry to defining your terms and being sure what it is you're, you're trying to get to. A few other things. And, uh, I, th I think it might have been William who mentioned invasives. Uh, of course, much about the biology of bringing species back, or even more extremely, introducing species that have not been here before to try and get the processes uh, re-established, is directly comparable to what happens by accident when an invasive species comes to this country, or any other, often with disastrous consequences. So I think conservation biologists need to be very careful not only to learn from invasive species biology, often problematic when they're thinking about the desirabilities of reintroductions, but also to be ethically and logically consistent in what they say is a good thing or a bad thing about bringing different species here. I've worked a lot on American mink, widely vilified as an invasive species, um, but they bring a predatory system to uh, an area which maybe was lacking a particular predatory system. I'm not advocating the American mink. I'm pointing out there can be inconsistencies in the way that biologists look at different species, just as there are for other people too. As we went and came into the room, I think it was Sue who drew our attention to the fact, certainly somebody did, that there's a question when people think about rewilding, about wild things and wilderness, as to whether wild implies no management. And yet, to some extent or another, almost all of the species pointed out that almost every ecosystem on Earth, and certainly every part of nature in the United Kingdom, is to some extent a reflection of human intervention and often very, very heavily managed. So please, don't be too frightened of management. The, the, everywhere there is conservation, there is management. Don't let that be a reason for putting you off an intervention such as bringing species back or even bringing species that weren't necessarily there before, or certainly not, uh, let it put you off conserving them. So as I draw to a close, my fifth point, I think I was going to make six, is to do with what we heard about some of the candidates amongst charismatic mammals uh, of species that are either already back or might come back within our lifetimes, I think, in different ways to this country. And I want to talk about three which I've got some personal experience with. Um, one of them is beavers. Um, we heard about the wonderful work that's been going on in Napdale with the beaver reintroduction. Uh, my team's the scientific auditor of that whole process, so we're very deeply engaged with it. Uh, and I think we can see there that the beavers bring back not just an animal, but as we heard, a uh, an engineering of the environment which is about restoring process. That's what's so exciting about the beaver in this case. Turn to wolves uh, and think more about process. You'll find it's a commonplace for people to say, I believe, when they talk about wolves coming back, about how nice it would be to see predation regulating prey populations. Well, actually, these things are studyable by science. We can look at the nature between predator and prey between wolves and, for example, red deer, and we can either study empirically in the field in other parts of the world or modeling computers in this country exactly how the wolves would have to function in Scotland if they were to deliver not only the occasional wolf to be seen by the occasional tourist, or maybe the very populous tourist, but if they were required, if they were there, to deliver regulation of the deer population. Very, very different answers in terms of population dynamics. Actually, to cut a long story short and quote work I've done with a postdoc in my group, Chris Sandham, who's somewhere in the audience, um, looking at modelled wolf populations, uh, the only way that wolves could regulate red deer in Scotland would be if they were in a fenced area. And by the way, the only way I think it's even remotely possible in our lifetimes that wolves might return to Scotland would be in a fenced area. But by doing so, and somebody mentioned money, I think we're straight into the thought that wolves might generate the most colossal amount of tourist revenue for bits of land that otherwise uh, may struggle to generate just so much. M my point here uh, in my closing minute is about teeth. 
teeth of an intellectual sort rather than the sort that wolves and beavers and lynx might have because I think a lot of the questions we've heard about tonight are questions that can be tackled very effectively today about the consequences of reintroducing these animals by pretty hard-nosed science which can give us predictions and answers to what we should do. So my concluding thought there is somebody said, and they were quite right I think to say it, um, there is no business of one size fits all in this this context. Links, different situation to wolves, different situation to beavers, different situation to the narrow-headed ant. Um, there's no one size fits all, but there is one approach that fits all, and that approach is to study the science, the ecology, the social science, the human impacts of the system that you're looking at, and to use that to create evidence that you use to make an evaluation. That evaluation will be different for each species, but nonetheless the process of understanding, I think, think is the same. So I conclude by saying it seems to me, and I sense from all those hands that Kate found were up in the room at the beginning and at the end, that most of us have spent most of our lives, especially in this country, living in a world where what conservation was about was, understandably, holding the line. Let us, for Pete's sake, stop things getting worse. I think when we start talking about rewilding sensu stricto, when we start about talking about restoring processes to ecosystems and perhaps reintroducing some species that have been lost recently, we're doing something rather more radical and rather more exciting. We're saying let's not just hold the line, let's look now to a time where we try to push back and recreate aspects of natural processes in recreated aspects of wilderness, wilderness in a managed sense, that would have been possibly a dream that would be scarcely beyond reach 20, 30, 40 years ago. But I think it is within reach today, politically within reach, culturally and socially within reach. So those were my half dozen quick points, but a summariser has another duty, and that is prolific thanks all around the place. Um, the, the, the panel has been wonderful. Uh, the chairman has been similarly wonderful. The audience has, of course, been great. Uh, I'm told by my minders that I should, I should thank the webinars as well. I could appear curmudgeonly and tell you, since I don't know what they are, it's hard for me to thank them. Um, it, it wouldn't be strictly true, but it, yeah. Anyway, thank them. Um, of course, above all, as people have said already, none of this would have happened without the tireless work of the Earthwatch team. Thanks on your behalf to them. And similarly, none of it would have happened, uh, as always in life, without the sponsors, in particular Mitsubishi. So thanks to them as well. Um, uh, those of you who have been inspired by what you've heard, I should remind you that both Christina and William run projects uh, to which Earthwatch uh, uh, people can go. And so please look at the right website, look at those projects and think if you, if you want to sign up. Uh, also, a bit of news looking ahead, uh, I think that the next uh, event that you all will want to go to is the Freshwater event, um, which is part of a wonderful Freshwater Watch program Earthwatch has been running, and it's on Wednesday the 18th of February, if I'm reading the notes correctly. Nobody's shaking their head. Wednesday the 18th of February, a date for your diary. Look on the website, find out what I'm talking about. The final thing is that uh, Earthwatch, its employees and all that sail in her, invite you now to go to the bar and have a drink. Seems to me a good idea. Uh, and they ask me to fight back the embarrassment of saying to you that they'd be delighted if you donated some money to them too. Um, so I think those are all the things that I was meant to say. And what's meant to happen next, Kate, am I right, is that we are meant to sort of lead the way out of here like a school crocodile or something of that sort. Um, and the rest of you find your way to the bar in due course. Like a rewind. There we are.